Moving on. Yes, RJ. I think with Ignite today and tomorrow, we have like this proximity, right? A proximity with the different innovators from the private sector, the businesses and corporations present here, as well as the startups um, from the Philippines and also from around the region, I hear. So guys, let's take this opportunity to really collaborate and ignite that partnership between startups and corporations. So again, thank you very much to Barbara. We now continue our conference with our panel discussion. For Ignite, we have a very interesting and diverse lineup of speakers, right, RJ? That's right, and right now, very interesting discussion, which I'm sure a lot of the startups are looking forward to, our discussion on venture capitalism, a global perspective. Now, our first panelist here today he has been involved in internet-related businesses since the late 90s and participated in the planning and setup of WebCrew Inc., whose automobile insurance price comparison website became a hit and was later listed on Tokyo Stock Exchange, uh, talk ex in the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Uh, closer to home, he led several initiatives to nurture and unearth entrepreneurial talents within corporates and the public at large through angel matching, funding, and pre-accelerator programs. He has had stints with iParentis, helping Petronas embark on its e-learning initiative across the company. And he began his career in KPMG Consulting in New York City, helping clients optimize their technology infrastructure. Please welcome Mr. Rees Norden. A round of applause, please. To join us also in this panel discussion, he has been involved in the internet-related businesses since the late 90s, but also in 2000, he co-founded and became the CEO of Interscope, which was sold off to Yahoo Japan in 2007, and later emerged with Macromill in 2010. He co-launched an internet research society, Internet Research Forum of Japan, assuming the position of chairman a field he has made great contributions to. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome founder and CEO of Dream Vision Inc., Iko, Mr. Iko Hiraishi. Next, we have the managing partner of Quest Ventures, a leading venture fund for technology companies that have scalability and replicability in large internet communities. Prior to this, he was a co-founder and COO of 55 Tuan, a NASDAQ-listed e-commerce group that grew to more than 200 cities and 5,000 employees across China. Please welcome Mr. James Tan. We also have today an investor who joined Gree Ventures in 2017. He is based now in Singapore and invests across Southeast Asia. He graduated from three-year dual degree at the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, and Harvard University's JFK School of Government. With a focus on entrepreneurship finance and technology policy, he was an associate also prior to his graduate program at Al Rayyan Investment, a Qatar-based affiliate of the Qatar Investment Authority. He was involved in M&A transactions as well as funding stru front structuring and private equity investments. He co-founded DocX Legal, a legal technology startup in the Middle East. Earlier in his career, he was an investment banker at Citi and Lazar. He attended Audencia Business School in France, graduating in 2009 with a Master in Management. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Mr. Samir Shaibi. Our last member of our panel discussion, the co-founder as well as the senior vice president and treasurer of Kickstart Ventures, the corporate venture capital arm of Globe Telecom. He also concurrently supports Globe in its M&A activities, which in the past have included acquisitions of Yondu, which was formerly Entertainment Gateway Group, and Bayan Telecommunications. His career track has mostly been in global tech-related companies, particularly in telecommunications, personal portable computers, and over a decade in tech venture investing with Jafco Asia. With senior level stints in key global markets, including the US, Japan, 
Europe, Southeast Asia, and Australia. He holds a BS in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Notre Dame and dual master's degrees from the University of Pennsylvania's Lauder Institute in International Studies, minoring in German Studies, and the Wharton School of Business. We have Mr. Dan Ichikawa Siazon. And of course, our moderator for this panel discussion, a Southeast Asian affiliate of a global nonprofit organization that catalyzes economic growth by accelerating high impact entrepreneurs. Prior to Endeavor, he founded Hatch, a tech incubator, incubator in the Philippines that has built a portfolio of consumer tech companies and was a co founder of IRG Limited, a Hong Kong based MA advisory boutique where he worked on various transactions in telecoms, media, and tech sectors across the Asia-Pacific. He's also past president of the Philippine chapter of the Entrepreneurs Organization and sits on the board of directors of Sky Cable. He has an MBA from Harvard Business School and a BA from Yale University. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome the managing director of Endeavor Philippines, Mr. Manny Ayala. You forgot one, you forgot one very important thing. I'm also the, the oldest guy on stage here. Are you well, sure? take it away, Manny. Thanks so much, Kuya Manny. The stage Thank is yours. You, Evo. So I, I have a very important question for the audience. Um, how many of you stayed up late last night to watch France beat Croatia? Raise your hand. How many of you are sleepy? Raise your hand. Okay, so Alele Bleu, Vive la République. Congratulations to, uh, actually, to Samir, who's from France. Thank you. So today, I'm going to do something different, guys. Okay, I hope you're okay with this. Normally, it's you guys in the driver's seat with nervous, trembling entrepreneurs groveling to convince you to sign the check. So today, what I'd like to do is actually turn the tables and ask you guys to do a one-minute pitch to the audience. Tell them a little bit about what you do and why you do what you do and why you're good for them. Okay, so maybe we start with you, start with the nearest, with Ken. Your one-minute pitch. Me? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Shasson from Kickstart Ventures. We're probably the most active venture capital company in the Philippines. We are a corporate venture capital spun off in 2012. Uh, Minette and I decided and managed to convince uh, uh, Globe to, for us to explore uh, innovation in, in, by way of investments. Uh, by that, to learn and also to seek a return. Um, we have 35 companies that we've visited to date. We look at primarily the Philippine market where we can do earlier stage deals. Um, and we also look into Series A and beyond for uh, in uh, geographies outside the Philippines that are strategic to, to our interests. And some of those include coins locally, uh, regionally in Southeast Asia, C88, which is the largest financial marketplace in the Philippines and Indonesia, um, including things a little more uh, further out in Toronto, we've invested in Wattpad, um, um, which has since closed uh, an investment with uh, Tencent um, earlier in the year. Um, that's for content because telcos, our, our owners being telcos, were evolving into more uh, content pur purveyors and providers uh, than pure, uh, pure telecommunications. So that's a bit about Kickstart. Great. Thank you. Samir? Hi, everybody. Um, I am a banker turned entrepreneur turned VC. I work now for Green Venture, which is a Japanese early stage fund, and we invest across Japan, Southeast Asia, and India. I personally cover uh, Southeast Asia out of Singapore. Um, we do, as I said, mostly early stage, which is C2 Series A investments. We are sector agnostics. We've done a lot of e-commerce and marketplace deals around the region. Now we spend a lot of time looking at other sectors such as fintech, healthcare. Um, so yeah, please reach out to me if you have any ideas. Great, thank you very much, Samir. James, what's your pitch? Hi everyone, my name is James Tan from Quest Ventures. Uh, we are one of the um, largest seed funds in Southeast Asia and China. Uh, today, if you buy and sell anything that's low value to high value, something that's used to something like a house or anywhere in between like a car, you will probably be using a product that we have funded at the seed stage. So examples would be Carousel, 99.co, Shopback, um, Xfirst, uh, products like this we, under what we term digital commerce. Anything that helps commerce happens, 
uh, we are probably one of the funders in the companies that you are aware of today. Great, thank you very much. Um, and to your left, <coughs> Iko. Yeah, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Iko Hiroishi from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, actually, uh, this is absolutely my first time in the Philippines. Uh, I'm very honored to be a part of such a great event. Okay, welcome. welcome uh, thank you. And uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, uh, also angel investor, and uh, running the small friends. And uh, our portfolio spread uh, into the United States and the uh, European countries and also Japan. Uh, but uh, roughly uh, out of Japan, uh, more than uh, half of the, uh, my uh, portfolio companies are uh, New York City, San Francisco, London, Berlin, etc. And then, so to uh, give the uh, startups over here uh, kind of courage, uh, I made a successful uh, two exits, one IP and one MID, M and a deal to the Yahoo Japan. But the, uh, after that, I screwed up so beautifully. Uh, the company is called the Dream Vision, which I reactivated uh, from last year, July. So even though you go fail, you can be back on stage. So as long as you're serious and uh, you know, make efforts and hard work, then someone is watching you guys, right? So uh, you don't have to worry about it. That's my message. Absolutely, well said. I have many scars on my back. Riz, what's your pitch? All right, Mabuhai, everyone. So this is my first time in Manila. So very exciting city. And the food was awesome. Oh. Um, so I'm, I represent Mongsil Ventures. So Mongsil Ventures motto is entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. Why we say that? Because most of us have either co-founded companies or work in operating uh, capacities before we join the firms. Uh, the, two fund, the, the two founders of the fund, uh, Koi and Ping, between the two of them, they have created and sold three companies in the US. The most prominent one is Match.com, before Tinder and Bumble and all that stuff. So, um, Mongsil Ventures invests in Series A companies in Southeast Asia, or companies outside of Southeast Asia who want to have a presence in Southeast Asia. Uh, companies that we have invested in is C88, Ninja Van, and also Scalable Capital, which have exited to Blackstone. Right. Terrific. So if you're an entrepreneur in the audience, never be scared to ask the, uh, the, the illustrious VCs to say why they're good for them for, or for you. Um, I thought for, uh, for this morning session, which I think has been sort of shrunk to 30 minutes, uh, we would, since we just did the World Cup, we would have a World Cup framework. So what I'd like to do is talk about the league table for VC, right? And so I saw a recent report that's, that said that um, last year in 2017, uh, the U.S. Was, a, uh, was the gold medal winner with $72 billion of venture capital funding. Uh, Asia, which includes China and India, came in at second with $71 billion, and Europe was a far, far third at $18 billion. And I think if you look at the growth rates, at some point, I think Asia has a chance of actually overtaking the U.S. So within Asia, about 75% of that is actually Chinese VC, right? And the rest of it is split between Japan, India, Southeast Asia. I think Israel's even counted in there. So what I thought we might do, since we have uh, this United Nations cast of characters here, is to have each one of you share a little bit about what's happening with venture funding in the markets that you've operated in, right? So maybe first I'll start with you, James, since um, you know, you've been <clears throat> extremely active in China. In fact, you've been an entrepreneur in China, have had success exiting in China, and now I think half of your portfolio is in China. So perhaps you can share with the audience what's, uh, what's going on in this world in China. And, uh, and, and why are you here in the Philippines? I think I echo what Equa Sun has said. It's a very exciting event at Ignite, so we are very really delighted to be here. Um, in China itself, every sector you can conceive of, whether it is normal e-commerce, down to um, the latest stuff like Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, or AI, or autonomous vehicles, you can find champions that have emerged or are emerging. The four trends that we see, and this is echoed in the recent in China Internet report, is that the hand of government is everywhere. So we have government involvement in every sector you can think of, whether as a regulator or actively pumping in money into VCs or direct investments into startups uh, at the late, much later stage like C&D &D and E and so on. So hand of government is in it. Second trend is rural economy is picking up, or rather rural users, rural internet users are picking up, and how many of them? 205 million 
I mean, 200 million rural users, that's already more than the population of uh, whether it's Japan or whether it's the Philippines. It's a huge population and that's rising. But their disposable income is only about US dollars, $1,800 a year. We see that going to rise, but there's not a lot of disposable income compared to what we see in the first tier cities. Uh, but we see them spending a lot more. And the third one would be uh, education is coming, uh, going very deep into rural, rural, um, the rural population. So you see streaming and so on all, all, all going in. In other words, education or the lack of quality education is no longer an issue for the rural population. And therefore, a lot of smart people from the 200 million is going to emerge and going to take a slice of the internet pie. Um, and the last one is, well, there's a lot of VC money that's going into every conceivable sector, whether it's from a government side, but now on the public side. And we see a lot more US institutionals and other institutionals around the world, including Europe, coming in and wanting to have a bite of the, of the pie. And that number is likely to continue growing, correct? Yes, it will likely continue. Now, what about the other way, money from China coming into markets like this? Because obviously you have the big corporates like um, Alibaba and Tencent already, you know, sort of planting their flags across the region. Um, do you see institutional money as well flowing into the region? Many, I think that's a very uh, interesting observation. We, we definitely see Chinese money coming out. And these are not Chinese money that has been repurposed from the money from the US and Europe and then, you know, reflowing out. These are Chinese corporates that, are, uh, that know that uh, like Unilever who before us that know very clearly that they cannot afford to let startups take a pie of their normal businesses. Yep. So they're investing. And uh, we have a phrase that is called BATX with the recent Xiaomi. So B for Baidu, Alibaba and Tencent and X. Uh, the, three, the first three BAT are very actively investing outside. We don't see Baidu that often, but they are very actively investing in China itself. Uh, you are going to see a lot more of Ali Financial and N Financial and Alibaba coming out and, and making a lot more investments. I think the main question we have to ask ourselves as, as Southeast Asians, as Filipinos and so on, is do we want to build a company to become an eventual US or Chinese companies or do we want to build a real Filipino company uh, and stand on our own? Great, we can tackle that uh, in, in a bit. Um, let's go from uh, the, uh, the gold medal winner in Asia, maybe to, I'm not sure if Japan today is silver or bronze, but you're up there. So one of my observations, just you know, going around the region, going to VC conferences, I see quite a number of Japanese investment professionals who are now based in either Singapore or Indonesia doing deals across the region. So perhaps you could uh, give the audience a sense of what's, what's happening with funding in Japan and why is all this money coming out? Okay, uh, in the uh, back room, so uh, Mani uh, told me the Japan is uh, kind of declining and shrinking the economy. That's why money coming out from the Japan to the Southeast Asian countries. But uh, that is partially true, but uh, there's a lots of stories behind. So uh, startup phenomena, is especially uh, IT-related startups, uh, that was happening back in uh, uh, late 1990s, meaning uh, it has become uh, 20 years. So I'm uh, one of the uh, first generation IT related uh, entrepreneurs. And if compared to those days, uh, the uh, startup ecosystem in Japan has become entirely different, very, very rich and uh, strong. So last year, uh, latest uh, uh, statistics says the, uh, we have Three billion USD are VC funding. Uh, that is the uh, highest uh, last uh, for the last 10 years. So uh, the uh, trend, I would say, are uh, corporates uh, very uh, are keen and uh, serious to uh, learn how to get in touch with the startups. Mm -hmm. And also, we have, uh, I would say, three or four generations since the uh, late 1990s. So uh, the uh, successful entrepreneurs have become our, our angel investors that to invest in the you know, you know, next generation. So we have now three or four cycles. So that has uh, become a uh, kind of phenomenon rich and uh, very strong, right? And uh, uh, to your question, uh, because Southeast Asian countries are emerging market, in terms of the uh, population and, of course, the economy. So that's why 
especially independent VCs like uh, uh, Gree Ventures, Cyber Agent Ventures, or uh, a lot more ventures, uh, VCs are coming into the uh, Singapore to headquartered and are looking for the uh, uh, local markets. That is the trend. Great, thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, so we've been through the uh, the gold and silver. Now let's let's look at Southeast Asia, right? So we now have Reese, Samir, and Dan. Um, just a few stats from a report that came out about a year and a half ago, in terms of um, number of startups. Right, you got. Um, Let's say Indonesia with over two, uh, let's see, what is this? 2,000, over 2,000 startups in Indonesia. Um, Malaysia, over 700. Singapore, over 1,800. Philippines, 370 plus. Um, so maybe, maybe we start with you, Samir, out of Singapore. Maybe you can, um, it's a, actually quite interesting, right? You're a Frenchman living in Singapore, uh, doing deals in Southeast Asia for a Japanese corporate venture arm, right? So, but perhaps specifically you can talk about what's going on in Singapore, which I see, you know, that the, uh, the fingerprints of the government are actually quite present in a lot of what's happening. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, I think, you know, Singapore has always been sort of like regulatory hub slash commercial hub for the region, like for, you know, many reasons, right? And I think the government of Singapore has essentially uh, piggybacked on this and tried to develop uh, a startup ecosystem where, you know, wherever you, wherever you think of doing business in the region, regardless of this, you still have your base of operation in, um, in Singapore, right? So that has always attracted a lot of capital um, and a lot of startups, a lot of talent, right? Um, I think for the Singaporean market itself, uh, the, obviously the big differentiation is size. Um, this is mostly uh, a B2B driven market, right? Uh, there, are, you see tons of like corporates. Uh, like we just heard about Unilever before us. Um, so we see tons of corporates in the market. So most of the startups that are being created there are for those uh, um, clients, right? Um, the other thing is, uh, and you rightly mentioned that, uh, government. I think government has spent a lot of time sort of trying to uh, catalyze the innovation that has been happening in their uh, scientific labs like ASTAR and others uh, into startups. And that has been finally starting to trickle now. With, um, you, know, you know, we have a couple of programs like Entrepreneur First and others that are really focusing on deep tech, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's for, I think, Singapore. I think um, also just to sort of like uh, add on, on, the, on the China sort of phenomenon in Southeast Asia, um, what we see is a lot of um, startups sort of like now looking up to Chinese investors or uh, Chinese startups and saying, I want to be the met one of Southeast Asia. I want to be, uh, you know, the next Alibaba of Southeast Asia. Rather than, uh, for me, who's been educated in the U.S., you know, the next Uber or next Amazon. I think that's now the new generation of, 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 of startups and the new generation of entrepreneurs are looking more to China as, a, you know, the way forward. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. Can I ask questions? Of course you can ask questions. This is a conversation, right? This is a informal. The whole idea here is to share your knowledge with the audience so that they get a better sense of what's going on. Plus, for you also to expand your own knowledge right, of these markets. So please go ahead. Right, I mean, to Sami and James, uh, you see a lot of infusion of Chinese money coming to Southeast Asia, right? Um, in the early days of Chinese infusion into America, a lot of Americans called them with tourist money. Tourist, tourist, money. yeah, tourist yeah. money, right? So they 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 are here just to for a short while. They will come. They they will go home. So did you see? Do you see these Chinese investors coming to Southeast Asia as smart money or tourist money? <laughs> okay. Um, for me, uh, and um, maybe I'm going to talk about Indonesia a bit more here because that's where I see the most influence coming in. Um, for Indonesia, it really depends on the sector. So uh, I think you have strategic bets being made uh, for the long term in Indonesia, and that's mostly e-commerce, because everybody, uh, us included, has Japanese investors who want to tap into that consumer story of Indonesia, right? So Alibaba has invested, obviously, as back to, you know, the biggest player there. And that trend of like tapping the consumer story is not going to change, right? It's still going to be there. Um, where we see tourists' money coming in, is in sectors that are um, yet to be, I would say, regulated or stabilized by, by the local authorities. So a very good example of this is uh, P2P lending. 
There's tons of capital from China being deployed. I think um, out of the 50 regulated fintech P2P lending startups in Indonesia, there is 25 of them that have Chinese capital, right? And there is, I think, 150 application now standing in the uh, uh, office of the OJK, which is the local fintech regulator. Out of 150, 120 are from China. Um, and yeah, so that sort of gives you an example of that tourist yield seeking uh, capital. Wow. If I could just interject, because the tourist thing is funny, but uh, in fact, I think they're laying the groundwork for their tourists to come to Southeast Asia in a way. <laughs> Uh, because you can see in all the Asian markets, um, the Alipay functions and the WeChat, they're starting to be activated, but in some markets, it's only activated for the Chinese visiting. But I think eventually, they'll roll it out. Once it's established, the next phase will be rolled out for the local markets. And I think that's kind of, so it's actually a tourist ploy, play, but for the long run, is one theory. Okay. Um, so let's go, let's go to you. Uh, you're based in Malaysia. You work for a regional fund called Monks Hill. Um, actually, sitting here in the Philippines, I'm, actually, I'm quite envious that Grab you know, came out of Malaysia right, as a unicorn, that Aymani had a, you know, a beautiful exit. And uh, may, maybe you can just tell us what's going on in Malaysia that you have these success stories. And then maybe you might comment also on this change of government and whether that affects anything, right? <laughs> yes. Uh yeah, so I think that's right. So I think Malaysia um, um, is a bit unique because I think it's in this, it sits in the middle of Singapore and Indonesia in the sense that even from economic development um, and maturity, it sits in the middle. I think Singapore is, can be categorized as developed country and then um, Malaysia, I mean Indonesia is emerging and Malaysia sits in the middle. Uh, so, and all, that's one. Um, because our infrastructure is a bit more developed than Indonesia, but not as developed as Singapore. That's one. The second one is the, uh, I think the composition of the population as well. So we have Chinese, we have Malay, we have Indian. So we cover, um, so when we go to, in, we may start in Indo Malaysia, and when we go to Indonesia, we can understand how Indonesians think, and we can even speak and understand the language. And to Singapore, we, I mean, we inherit, we share common legacy with Singapore. So I think it's very fluid, very seamless. So I think this, uh, when we start in these three countries, um, so there's a lot of people in Malaysia that say that, okay, we can start in Malaysia. That's a model of Southeast Asia to the extent of Singapore and, uh, Singapore and Indonesia. Um, another thing is, that, like Singapore, there's a lot of infusions of capital or regulation or push from the government. I think there's a lot of agencies uh, that government set up to put money into the ecosystems uh, like Magic, Cradle, MDAC, KMP, and so on and so forth. So I think that has, has put, laid down the seed or the infrastructure for Malaysian companies to try. This, this whole initiative started probably like 10, 20 years ago, and I think we're seeing the fruit of it in the last five to 10 years. Um, when it comes to the new government, uh, it's very interesting. Um, I, for one, would suggest that the institutions that, that I mentioned just now, that I rattle off, there are about six or seven of them with overlapping uh, mandates and responsibilities. So I think it would be wise for the government to uh, consolidate so that we can bring more focus and resources to further develop the ecosystems. Uh, right now, the indication is positive. So some of the ministers are younger than me. And they're all tax savvy, and all they can consider like millennial, millennials. So they are in tune with what the tech world is, it uh, can offer. So I think they are, from that point of view, they are very positive and they're very supportive of the tech ecosystem in Malaysia. Great, thank you very much. So, last but not least, we have you know close to home. We have Dan. So I'd like Dan to share some of his thoughts. But then after he's done, actually ask all of you, what do you think about the Philippines, right? And what would it take yeah. for you to seriously consider? An investment here. So Dan, I'll let you start. So it's ironic that the biggest guy on this panel is the smallest market. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a, the Philippines is a, is a work in progress. I think uh, I look with some envy at uh, some of the progress made, especially in Indonesia, a market that is very similar to ours in all aspects, it seems. Um, it's still a work in progress, but I think we find promise, and this is why we're here. But it's also not, not a surprise then that it is a corporate venture capital that has to kind of 
pick up the activity where maybe the pure venture will find hard to make a living out of this market alone. Um, but in that sense, uh, since we started in 2012, we started small um, to test the waters. There have been a few early stage uh, companies that have come out of the works and I w we want to believe that part of our efforts have encouraged others to choose an option other than the corporate to start to build their own dreams. And you know, it's not just BPO, use your skills to be something that you can build um, on your own. We have partnered with several like-minded people. We have welcomed the entry of uh, Endeavor, for example, uh, with Manny to try to build that network and encourage investment. And lastly, we put uh, our money where our mouth is. So we've made investments since 2012, 35 of them, about eight of them are outside, but all the, the bulk of which are locally uh, in the Philippines. I think what I'd like, what, what I like is just at least statistically, the increase in number of deal flow while starting from a deal a lower base has grown um, by 30, 40 percent. Um, then the amount of monies deployed is still limited, um, but growing. And also the interest from foreign venture capital, I think, has increased. Mainly, uh, one phenomenon we notice is that, um, again, as a market, it is not to be forgotten we are 100 million people. So it is not a market you could ignore. After Indonesia, Anybody who does well in Indonesia will look to the Philippines because we have a structure similar and we have needs similar. So oftentimes we find our deal flow when the guys who invested in Indonesian startups come knocking because as a market. They come to the Philippines as a market because of the market entry interest and we can help. And that's a value that we bring to the table and also that's a way to get deal flow. And for us it clocks, it gets the uh, juices flowing in terms of local companies who want to do the same overseas. And that's what we found. So guys, here's what's promising, at least from where I sit, right? Apart from the fact that we're the second largest country in Southeast Asia, we, we have, I think, the youngest population, right? And it's a young, digitally savvy population. In fact, I sometimes like to say we are a nation of ADD, addicted to digital it's, device. The right? stats around 80%, 75% are below 30. That's right, that's right. I think average age is 23 and a half or something like that. And then the last thing is, don't forget, for the last eight years, we've had a really good run economically. We've had GDP growth that ranges from 6 to 7%, and I think the outlook for the next few years is similarly uh, encouraging. So, so with that, I just wanted maybe to wrap up, get your thoughts on the Philippines and what it would take for you to actually do something here. Sorry, uh, this is not an answer to your question, but um, I'd like to learn uh, uh, about the Southeast Asian countries because the, as a concept, SEA exists, but the, every single uh, different country has a every different culture and the uh, level of the economy, also social structure. Maybe as he mentioned, you know, there are some uh, similarities, of course, but they're basically very different, right? So uh, how uh, you know, startups here uh, expand their business uh, out of their home country? That is uh, my curiosity. And uh, the other uh, thing I wanted to discuss about that we're running at PAMI is uh, the political kind of situation U.S. and China uh, must be kind of you know, influenced to the uh, startup or VC related uh, circumstances. So uh, how if the U.S. government is seriously can uh, uh, re regulate. Stop me. Uh, but anyway, so uh, those kind of situation is changed. Uh, if U.S. Uh, regulations, maybe they don't want me to speak about the politics uh, topic, right? So, <laughs> anyone want to take that? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah, so those kind of things. So. But how, uh, in terms of the uh, technology point of view, so U.S. and Israel, for example, still are ahead from all of us. So, but the, in terms of the population, Southeast Asian countries are really growing and emerging. So that is I think the, uh, maybe to lend him your mic, James. So uh, anyway, so uh, all of us understand my uh, you know, question. So if anyone could kind of address to my uh, uh, question or curiosity. Accept the question. Uh, in terms of the uh, technology, yeah, U.S. 
and the, uh, for example, Israel, still pretty ahead yeah. yes. from the all over our, us Asian yeah. countries, right? Yes. So in terms of the population, I mean the uh, uh, kind of market, so Southeast Asian countries are re very attractive. However, to expand and uh, to uh, kind of uh, grow the uh, uh, startup phenomena, not the uh, catching up the US or you know, those kind of things. So I think uh, we need Asian countries develop the uh, uh, unique technologies competing with the US or Israel. Uh, what do you think of that point? Uh, to, to be realistic, uh, Southeast Asia market, and we have many internal discussions, uh, the Southeast Asian VC market is about looking for startups with the best business models suited for their markets. So it is not a place I'm gonna find nanotechnology, uh, certainly not in the Philippines. It's a developing country, we have other priorities. Um, but it might be for the application of technology from outside for the consumption in market and a marketplace that is vibrant, that is growing, and that has a growing uh, middle class that is ready to spend for those products. So that's kind of how I see it. And to the extent that, for example, you representing Japan for this moment, if there are technologies that can be transferred into this market from which, uh, let's say, you could start businesses, then that's kind of a thing that we'd be interested in. But, you know, we're not trying to out Israel or out Silicon Valley. I don't think that's a practical aspiration in the near term anyway, right? Okay. But we um, are a market. I'm being asked to wrap up. So if I could quickly go Reese, then James, then Samir, Philippines. What would it take? Well, definitely a lot of potential. So I think I, I caught up with a friend of mine over the weekend before this conference. And then he said that the, the startup um, vibe is booming here. I think there's, there's a lot of potential. Uh, I think what the country needs is a bit, um, I don't want to ruffle any feathers, but I think the country, economically speaking, the structure is that it's been um, driven by several big companies or large family-owned companies. So I think they may have crowded the market and also crowded entrepreneurialism within the, within the economy. So I think if we can um, give birth to more independent thinking, um, population who would take the de I mean would take the risk to start companies and not grad go to school graduate and work with the big companies I think um, that's I think there's a way forward from in terms of talent and new business creation thank you James what do you think um, I echo what Reese has said uh, on the on the macro side maybe I go to on the aspirational side I think what Philippines need would be more um, startup heroes and startup heroes, whether they are running a unicorn or have exited a company, I think these need to be highlighted more. Uh, from the outside looking in, we are looking for exits that can happen from a Philippine startup. I mean, after all, we are in this to deliver returns. So we are not seeing that happen as much, let's say, Philippine, uh, Malaysia, for example. So we'd like to see that. Great, thank you. And Samir, you have the last word. Yeah, so thanks for that. Just like um, you have the uh, trophy this year. <laughs> We always have the last word, I guess. Um, no, so it, this is my first time in the Philippines. So first of all, thank you for inviting me. And what would it take me for in, to invest is probably a few more trips here. Uh, but honestly, just to echo my, uh, my fellow investors here, uh, I think we want proof of execution, that someone can come in and really develop something as fast as, I guess, our own investors want, and something that can transform from a Filipino play to something that is regional, right? And uh, uh, you know, I've been only for like not even 24 hours in, in Malina now and every, everybody that I meet uh, after I told them that I'm managing uh, Indonesia, they told me, oh, we are three or five years behind. Um, no, I just want you to catch up as fast as possible, I guess, for me to invest. Well, panelists, thank you very much for this extremely eye-opening conversation. I think we barely scratched the surface, uh, but we've run out of time. Uh, hopefully next year, when we're all together again, uh, Asia will be at the top of the league table. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear a round of applause for our panelists. And again, thank you so much to all the panelists. Maybe please invite all of you to continue staying here on stage just for a photo opportunity, not only of this panel, but of our previous speakers as well. Can we please invite on stage uh, Kotaro Adachi and the Tech Shake team to have photos together with our speakers here. Can we please invite back on stage uh, our speakers earlier here this morning, can we invite back on stage Mr. Paul Papa Dimitriou, Ramses Gallego, and Ms. Barbara Guerpillon for a photo together 
with our panel discussions this morning. And again, we'd like to remind everyone to continue uploading your photos online using our hashtag IgnitePH. IgnitePH2018. Can we call again uh, Mr. Paul Papa Dimitriou if he can join us here on stage? And again, we'd like to remind our guests. Can we call on Paul? Delegates, if you find the tallest man in the room, call him up on stage. Okay, thank you so much, and I'm sure hopefully our panelists will be available for people to speak with them later on. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Mani Ayala, for moderating. Iko, James, Reese, Samir, and Dan for a very interesting and invigorating discussion.